south of Britain, resort for peoples the world over. And so every year London welcomes tens of thousands of visitors. From all over Britain, indeed from all over the world, they come by land, air and sea. Some for government affairs, some for business and finance, and others for sport, entertainment and culture. But whoever they are and whatever their purposes, sooner or later they will go to see the sights. Perhaps it's London, the capital city, home of the king and queen, that they will want to see first. And here are King George VI, Queen Elizabeth and Princess Margaret at Temple Bar, on the occasion of the celebration of their majesty's silver wedding. The royal procession continues through crowd-lined streets and ends by going up the Mall and entering the gates of Buckingham Palace. The crowds, once restrained and orderly, now surge to the gates and repeatedly bring the King and Queen and other members of the royal family onto the balcony of the palace to acknowledge their cheers. We'll leave the palace to look at the Houses of Parliament, where Lords and Commons meet to fashion the King's laws and to promote the people's well-being. It's but a step from the Houses of Parliament to Westminster Abbey, where the monarchs of England have been crowned for a thousand years. The Abbey contains the tombs of many distinguished persons. In the centre of the nave is the tomb of the unknown warrior. He was buried there in commemoration of the sacrifices made in the First World War. Further west is the modern building, Roman Catholic Westminster Cathedral. If you follow the traffic out of Parliament Square, you enter White Hall, where the principal government offices are situated. The building on the left is the Home Office. And outside, in the centre of the roadway, is the Cenotaph, the national memorial to the dead of two world wars. Just off Whitehall is a narrow little cul-de-sac called Downing Street. Number 10 is the home of the King's Prime Minister, and at number 11 lives the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Whitehall leads to Trafalgar Square, overlooked by the Church of St Martin in the Fields. Most visitors go to the square to see Nelson's Column and the Fountain and to feed the pigeons. From Famous Square, we go east to Famous Court. This is the Central Criminal Court, nicknamed the Old Bailey, after the street in which it's situated. It is the court used for the trials of the major criminal cases of London. Further east, its dome a landmark, and standing in an area devastated by bombs is St Paul's Cathedral. Although damaged, these are wartime scenes, its survival of the bombing when all around it was destroyed is one of the miracles of the last war. St Paul's is 300 years old, but parts of the Tower of London, still further east, are more than a thousand years old. The attending beef eaters wear Tudor costumes and boys beat the bounds, once the old parish boundaries. When a royal infant is born, a salute of 41 guns is fired from the tower. Yes, London is a capital city, rich in historic building, pageant, procession and contrast. Contrast. East End. East End again. London is also a large and sheltered port. Seagoing ships from all over the world come up the Thames, some passing even beyond Tower Bridge. 69 miles of the river is under the control of the Port of London Authority. Cargoes of raw materials are unloaded and manufactured goods are loaded to take back. One ton in every three of Britain's overseas trade passes through the Port of London. But not all the ships on the Thames are big ones. At Charing Cross Pier near Westminster Bridge, you can take a little boat and go for a pleasure trip up or down the river. It's a busy river, the Thames. Along its banks are a number of factories, power stations too, 
serving homes and a great variety of industries. Take printing, for example. Many British and overseas publishers of books, magazines and newspapers have their offices or presses in London. This is the printing of an edition of the Times at the press just off Fleet Street. But the biggest London industry is transport. Not surprising, every day London passenger transport copes with about 13 million journeys made by people to and from school, work, shops or play. By bus, tube, tram and trolleybus. During the rush hour, some 26,000 people crowd the escalators to the Piccadilly tube. People also gather in Throgmorton Street in the city, that district between St Paul's and the Tower. Those city men deal with London's financial affairs in scores of banks and in company, shipping and insurance offices. A whirlpool of checks, credits, debits, stocks, shares, loans, profits, losses, bulls, bears and financial crises. But sedate and dignified amidst it all stands the Bank of England in Threadneedle Street. And just across the road is the old Royal Exchange. But where money is really made is in the Royal Mint, Tower Hill. In one way or another, they've been making money in this part of London for well over a thousand years. Money. <laughs> yes, you can spend it in London. Try the shops. Here's Bond Street, running between Oxford Street and Piccadilly, and Regent Street, running down to Piccadilly Circus. Less than half a mile away from this fashionable shopping centre is Berwick Street Market, where you can buy anything from old books and cherries to nylons, razor blades, fish, grapes or flowers. Three minutes and you're in Piccadilly Circus, where Eros, still and silent, watches over the meeting of six ways. The circus gets its name from a collar fashionable in the 17th century. You'll always find a policeman there. If you want to ask your way about, he is the man to approach. Courtesy, common sense, quick wit and wide knowledge. You can always count on his help. By a gesture, he will hold up the traffic for you and with a casual wave, release it again. He's worth watching, the London policeman. But he's not the only thing in London worth watching. Every year, lovers of sport go to see championship matches being fought out on the grass at Wimbledon. This is the centre court, and we're near the finish of a match between Ted Schroeder and Gardner Malloy. Here's the final shot that wins the match for Schroeder. But matches at Lords usually take a longer time to win or lose. If you're keen on cricket, you might like to make a day of it and relax in the sun. The game has its moments. A nice easy four to leg by Dennis Compton. England's wicketkeeper Evans is clean bowled. But later in the match he gets his revenge. It's a pleasant way to spend a sunny summer's day watching the comings and goings of the cricketers at Lords. The climax of the winter's sports season is the final of the Association Football Cup which takes place at the Wembley Stadium, usually in the presence of the King. A hundred thousand fans gather together to cheer their favourite side and their favourite players. Dennis Compton has the rare distinction of having played both at Lords and at Wembley. For 90 minutes, 100,000 people want nothing more than goals, and they seem to feel a near miss rather keenly. But the shout that goes up when the ball does actually go into the net simply has to be heard to be believed. And after the match, there's the sights and lights of London in the evening. Now, the crowds gather in and around Soho in the West End. Where shall we go? Cinema? News theatre? 
musical comedy or variety? What about the ballet? Well, there's plenty of free shows. Let's go and look at the shop windows, and then finish off the day by a stroll along the embankment. Lights reflected in the river. So, while some visitors...